Well, let's take our Bibles and let's go uh, put a marker in Romans chapter 5. All right, put a marker in Romans 5. And then we will go to John 3.16 is where we'll actually start reading. This would help if I come to those pages too, right? Normally I have the mark. So uh, Romans 5, and then we're going to turn back to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. The most quoted verse in the entire Bible, verse 16. Evangelist Billy Sunday used to say that this is the, the gospel in a nutshell, John 3, 16. Notice what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, what an amazing thing. I, when I was talking to a young man yesterday, I was able to lead a, a young man to the Lord. And uh, after he had prayed to trust Christ, this is the verse I went to. I said, now what does it say that God gave you when you believed on Jesus? You should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. How long is everlasting? Ever. Forever. That means if you've been saved, if you died, where are you going to go? Heaven. There's no doubt about it. You it's not because of how good we are. It's not because of all the stuff we've done. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with Jesus. And then we have everlasting life. You know, when I was growing up, my family told me I was named after the evangelist Billy Sunday. Really? You know what my real name, full name is? Sunday. William Sunday Emmons. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was quite a, quite a the evangelist. He that's a good person to be named after. Uh, I was named after a general. So. <laughs> Douglas MacArthur. That's who I'm named after. Anyway, wonderful. Look at verse 36, same chapter. John 3, verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It's a great verse. Show us before we trust Christ as our Savior, if we were to die, where are we going to go? We're going to go to hell because we do not have everlasting life. Uh, the wrath of God is on us. But because we believed on Jesus, we have everlasting life. Not we will have, we have it now. What a wonderful, Amen. wonderful thing. Let's pray. We'll get right into our lesson for this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in class this morning. I pray you'd help us as we study. I pray as we look at the subject of how can I know that I'm saved. I pray you take these truths and apply them to our hearts. And may we be encouraged by the, the confidence that comes from understanding the scripture. I pray you'll bless our class today. Bless the other teachers around the, the building as they're teaching as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 In, in our previous lessons, we've looked at... Um, our condition before God, before we were saved. We looked at what does it mean to be lost. and We saw all those different things. And then uh, we learned what the Bible says about salvation. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to look at how can I know that I'm saved. Uh, Satan, it's there in your notes at the bottom of page one, Satan will attempt to do several things uh, to a believer in regard to the salvation. Now you've got to understand that when you got saved, Satan got mad because he can't take you to hell now. There's nothing he can do to change your destiny because Jesus changed all of that. Amen? Amen. And, uh, but there are some things he will do. First of all, he will cause you to doubt whether or not you actually have eternal life. And, and here's why that's so important. A person who doubts their salvation will not be confident in telling others about that same salvation. And so uh, Satan knows he can't take you to hell anymore. But what he can do is keep you from taking anybody with you on the trip. And he wants to get you out of the will of God. So he will cause you to doubt. Number two, he'll bring confusion. I've, I've talked to and witnessed and counseled many people over the years that uh, they, they, they made a profession, but they doubted their salvation and they were confused about where they stood before God and when they're in that condition, they're not going to be a great servant for God. And then last of all, he will tempt you to go back to your old life. How many of you have found since you got saved, Satan keeps trying to pull you back? Back to the old ways and what you used to be. Hey, can, I, can I give you a little bit of warning? It doesn't get any easier. Uh, Paul the Apostle talked about that all the way through the book of Romans. He talks about the things that I would, I do not. The things I would not do, that I do. 
And here's the great Apostle Paul struggling with that thing. Every, one of the lessons we'll talk about in this series is why do I struggle to do right? We'll look at that down the road a little bit. Uh, but Satan does not want any believer to have confidence that they're on their way to heaven. You'll see that on the top of page two. And I put a lot of these notes in there. In, you know, I don't normally list this much of my outline to you. Uh, but I think these are important thoughts. He knows that if he can get a child of God to doubt their salvation, he can keep you from going on for God. And, uh, and, and then next of all, he will tell you, you can't really know that you're saved. How many of you ever heard somebody say that to you? You can't know that you're going to heaven. We hear it all the time. We're not knocking on doors. We can't know that. But the Bible does tell us in 1 John chapter number 5, in fact, this verse is not in your notes. I recommend you write this reference out. 1 John 5, 13. And verse number 13, it's just one of those verses every believer ought to know. 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on, on the name of the Son of God. Now, <clears throat> we're going to come back to that verse in, a, in the latter part of the lesson, uh, but we can know that. He will tell you that because you do not feel any different, nothing really happened to you. I hear this all the time. Well, I don't feel saved. Uh, let me put this down to a practical day-to-day -day thing. My wife and I have been married in June. will be 44 years. Amen. Right? There are days I wake up, I don't feel married. <laughs> it doesn't feel as warm and fuzzy as it did on June the 14th. Mark that date down. June the 14th, 1980. All right, uh, but does that mean I'm not married? No, I'm married. We signed a legal document. We exchanged vows, and uh, and I've been paying the bills ever since. But anyway, uh, she's not in there right now, so she'll probably watch the video. I'm in trouble right now. Uh, there are some mornings you're going to wake up, you're not going to feel saved. Anybody ever been that? You wake up, just maybe your heart's away from God. You maybe you've been in sin, or maybe just you've not been reading your Bible. You have not been praying. And the closeness is not there. But your salvation isn't based upon how you feel. Mm -hmm. It's based upon the truths of the Word of God. We're going to look at that this morning. Uh, next of all, he will try to plant doubts in your mind about the decision you made for Christ and the promises made to you in the Word of God. Uh, I have a, uh, a, a handout I will get to you next week, a little booklet that I wrote on can a saved person ever be lost? And in there, I talk about the, the impossibility of that ever happening because of all the promises God made. And I list those in, 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 in the book. Uh, but uh, the subject we're discussing today is often called the assurance of salvation. In fact, the booklet that you will get later today is called the eternal security. Same thing, meaning that we know we're going to heaven. And, uh, and so, how can I know that I'm saved? Several things we're going to look at. Uh, point number one, and this, and we'll go to John. Cha or, I'm sorry, Romans chapter five. Now, <clears throat> how can I know that I'm saved? The witness of the Spirit of God. Now, I've got several verses listed there. Um, I'm actually going to read from chapter eight first, and we'll come right back to five. Romans eight and verse number nine. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, the thing we've got to understand, in the New Testament, um, once a person gets saved, the Spirit of God moves inside. The Old Testament, it was not that way. The Old Testament, you'll never hear anybody talk about being filled with the Spirit of God or indwelt by the Spirit of God. All through the Old Testament, it's the Spirit of God came upon them. You hear it, see in the life of David several times. Of the life of, of uh, Samson, the Spirit of God came upon him. And then later, uh, when he sinned, uh, and he wist not that the Spirit of God was taken from him. You and I don't ever have that issue, because once we got saved, the Spirit of God moved inside. I'm going to, uh, let me show you a quick verse on that. You're there in Romans. Keep your place there. Go back to John, Gospel of John, chapter 20. Pastor touched on this last Sunday night in his message. It's an incredible, incredible passage of Scripture. One, this, this point here uh, for the Blade on people miss often reading this. Because people talk about, well, believers didn't have the Holy Spirit until Pentecost. And that's not what the Bible says. Look at John 20 
And of course, in um, in verse, uh, let's see here, starting in verse number 18, Mary Magdalene comes and tells the disciples verse, uh, that Jesus was raised. Verse number 19, the same day evening, so that's Sunday night, the, the, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, but the disciples were assembled and, and for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them. The pastor preached about that, how that on the evening of the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples, and they saw his hands and his, and, and his print. But I want you to notice verse number 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. You see that? He breathed on just like in the Garden of Eden when God took Adam, formed him out of the dust of the ground. And the Bible says in Genesis 3, he breathed in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The same way, here Jesus breathed on the disciples and they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So from that moment on, believers had the Spirit of God in them, not just on them. Does that make sense? So when you got saved, the Spirit of God moved inside of you. We'll go back to Romans now. Romans chapter 8 verse 9 said that now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That means if you do not have the Spirit of God living inside of you, you're not saved. But everyone who is saved does. Now let's look at Romans 5 and verse number 5. It says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. No longer does God live in a building. In the Old Testament, God would dwell at the temple, before the temple, the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. He would live, he would indwell the, the Holy of Holies. Uh, but now we see we are the temple of God. He doesn't live in a building. This, is, this building here, this church, is not the house of God. We call it that. But it's not, he doesn't live here. He lives in us. And, and, and so um, we, we need to understand that when you and I got saved, the Spirit of God lives in us. So how can I know that I'm saved? First of all, the, the, the witness of the Spirit of God. First of all, the indwelling. He lives in us. I love this verse in Galatians 4 and verse 6. The reference is there. But ye are sons. God hath set forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so when you and I got saved, the Spirit of God moved inside. He lives inside of us. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Amen. And it's also a challenging responsibility. That means you can't just go live any way you want to. You can't treat Christianity like, okay, I'm going to take my coat off today. I'm going to leave God out here, and I'm going to go into the bar. No, you go in the bar, he goes with you because he lives inside of you. You don't take the Holy Spirit off and put him back on. He lives inside of you. That's why we have the ability to quench and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And so, uh, how can we know that I'm saved? First of all, the witness of the Spirit of God, the indwelling. He lives in us. But look there at Romans chapter 8. This is a tremendous truth right here. Romans 8, look at verses 14 and 15. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Here the Bible is telling us that we are led by the Spirit of God. What does that mean? That means God directs us in our life. How many of you ever uh, been prayed about something, you were trying to make a decision, and you felt impressed to go a certain direction? It's the Spirit of God. He lives inside of us. How many of you have been, ever, uh, you were tempted to sin, and you were thinking about it, and you started to go that way, and all of a sudden it's like somebody put a stop sign in front of your face. Yeah. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. All right? He's directing you. And, and so the Bible says that we are led by the Spirit uh, of, uh, of God. For they are the sons of God. So when, when we get saved, the Spirit of God moves inside, and He guides us. Would you look at a very... Uh, important verse here. Go to John chapter 16. It's an amazing verse. John 16. And verse number 13. Jesus, as he's talking to the disciples, 
And he's explaining to them that he's got to go away. He's been talking about that. But notice what he says. Uh, we're going to back up to verse 12. Uh, John 16, 12. Jesus said, actually, we're going to back all the way up. Verse 7. I've got to get the context. I'm sorry. Just more verses. But John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. I'm going to pause. Notice Jesus, this is before he died, before he was buried, before he rose again, before he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. He said, I've got to go away. He's talking about what he talked about in John 14, that he was going to go to his father. He said, I've got to go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come and indwell you. And he says, and verse 12 is amazing. He says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. This is incredible. Where Jesus said, I want to teach you some things, but you can't learn it yet. So what's that like? What does that mean? Well, there's some things that had to happen first. Verse 13 tells us what it was. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he leads us, and he leads us into all truth. He guides us into all truth. That's why when we study our Bible, we start understanding truth. Remember how we talked about before a person saved, they cannot understand truth? It's because the Spirit of God is inside. He's the teacher. I've written several books, and, and uh, I wrote a book on, uh, on the bus ministry. Uh, I wrote it good, many years ago. And I remember I was in a church in Iowa, and the, the man who ran their bus tractor came to me and said, Pastor Robert, actually I was an evangelist in those days, he said, Brother Robert, i got to ask you a question. He said, I've had your book now for several years. And he referred to one of the chapters. What in the world were you talking about? And he, he asked this chapter, and so I was able to sit down and explain to him what I meant when I wrote that part of the book. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When you and I as believers read our Bible, the Spirit of God's on the inside teaching us what it says. That's his job. He will guide you into all truth. Not only do we have the presence of the Spirit of God living within us, but we also have his leading. And we also have, number three there in your notes, the witness or the testimony. Of the Spirit. Let's go back to Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8. And look at verse number 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, we may also be glorified together. Here, here the Bible is telling us that the Spirit of God inside of us gives us a testimony or a witness that we belong to God. That's part of his job. Jesus, as we just read in John 15, uh, promised the disciples when the comforters come um, that I will send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, he will proceed from the Father, he shall testify of me. That's why when you read the scriptures, the Spirit of God confirms those things. I have mean, been sitting in church and pastors mentioned something. Maybe you read the passage before. He's preaching and all of a sudden on the inside, you know, that's true. You know what that is? That's the Holy Spirit. That's his witness. Uh, in 1 John 5, 10, the Bible says, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. So when we got saved, the Spirit of God moves in. He's a witness, a testimony that we are children of God. Galatians 4, 6. Because your sons, God hath set forth the Spirit of His Son in your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit testifies or gives witness that we are the children of God. It is so important that we understand that we have that witness of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, take your Bibles now, if you would. Let's go to the book of 1 John. 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And we'll look at verse number 9. 1 John 5. I told you we'd be coming back to this passage. It's a great chapter. How can I know that I'm saved? The witness of the Spirit of God. Number two, the witness of the Word of God. 1 John 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness which God hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Notice how many times here the Bible says, and the Apostle John writing this says, this is written, the Word of God. This is the record. How do I know that I'm saved? Because the Bible says so. You know, I, I love that little song we sing with the kids. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The only way you ever knew that God loved you is because the Bible says so. The only way we know that Jesus died for our sins is because the Bible says so. In the testimony, verse 11, there in 1 John 5, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. Because God wrote it down. Over and over again, John 3.16, John, John 3.36, John 5.24... Over and over again, he gives us a record in his word. Now, if you would go to the, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. We were just there. I love it when in a passage of Scripture that God tells us why he wrote a particular portion of Scripture. In John 20, God tells us why the Gospel of John's in your Bible. John 20, and of course, we've got the story that Pastor preached on Sunday night. About Thomas, in verse number uh, 24, Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples wherefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I sh shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. So here's, here's Thomas after he hears that Jesus appears to them in the upper room. He said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Lest I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Unless I put my finger in the print of the nails in his hands, put my hand in the mark of the spear in his side, I will not believe. That's where we get the term doubting Thomas. Then in verse number 26, but and after eight days again, his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold thy, my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe it. It's a convicting verse. But the believer, Jesus calls him out by name. Yeah. Okay, Thomas, here's my hand. I heard what you said. We think we'd get away with that. No, God writes all that stuff down. <laughs> There's a record. How many of you are humbled by that? Yeah, that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Yeah, he's going to judge us by our faith. He said, don't be faithless, but believe him. And, uh, and Thomas answered, verse 28, and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Notice he didn't walk up put his finger in the print of the nails. He didn't do any of that. He just humbled himself before God. My Lord and my God. Verse 29, this is incredible. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's Amen. us. Amen. Amen. We haven't seen him. We haven't seen the print of the nails yet. But we believed. Why? Let's read verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You ever thought about the ones he didn't write down? All the many miracles he didn't record? We'll find that about in one day. But look at verse 31. But these are written. What's he talking about? The Gospel of John. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. God tells us, here's why I gave you the gospel of John. So you know Jesus is who he says he is. And that if you'll believe on him, you'll have eternal life. Amen. That's why when people come to me, he's like, oh, I'm just struggling with my faith. What do I do? Read the gospel of John. 
Somebody just gets saved. I want to read my Bible. Where do I read? Gospel of John. I don't send them to Genesis. Read John. Why? Because it, that book alone has is, got one focus. Proving who Jesus is and that believing on him is how we got saved. That's what he's talking about in 1 John. This is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. The strength of testimony is based upon the strength of a witness. Anybody ever sat on a jury before? I have. It's all my soul. It, it will totally change your viewpoint of the, the criminal justice system. What they show on TV is not very accurate. Uh, but I've sat there. And boy, you, you see an attorney start cutting away at the credibility of a witness. You realize how important a witness is? Well, our witness is what? The word of God. That is true. Every word of it. It's been proven true for centuries. We know that it's true. And so if you can, if you can undercut the, the authority and credibility of a witness, you can eliminate their testimony. Well, the witness of the word of God is as reliable as God himself. So we have the witness of the word of God. And quickly, we've got to look at the last one. Oh, man, we do not. We're going to do it. We're going to look at it. All right. What, what uh, things about the Word of God? Number one, the promises of God. Um, we see his promises. He promised to give us everlasting life, John 3, 36. Uh, John 5, 24. We read those earlier. G God has promised in his word that if I believe on his son, Jesus Christ, I would have eternal life. That's his promise. Uh, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I, I will in no wise cast out. That word no wise cast out, it's actually a double negative. Here's what God is saying. I will no, no, never cast you out. He's saying very positively, I'm not going to cast you out. If I come to him, I'm saved. Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt believe, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Um, Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm saved because he promised me that he, that he would. Uh, then second of all, the, the, the witness of the word of God, the proper understanding of the word. Remember in one of our first lessons in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we talked about how that the natural man, the unsaved man, cannot <coughs> excuse me, understand the things of God. Because we get saved and the Spirit of God lives inside, we start understanding the Scriptures. Let me ask you a quick question. How many of you have ever read the Bible and all of a sudden a truth jumped out at you for the first time? It's like, when did God put that in the Bible? It's always been there. But just like Jesus told the disciples, you weren't ready to receive that yet. It didn't grow in your faith and the Spirit of God said, okay, now it's time for you to understand. If you can read Scripture and understand what it's saying, that's a proof that you're saved. Because a lost man can't do that. Um, and then last of all, uh, how can I know that I'm saved? The witness of the Spirit of God, the, the witness of the Word of God, number two, and number three, the willingness to obey the Son of God. Uh, one of the verses that we quoted from last week, Romans, or John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. All right? uh, obedience, me hearing his voice and responding to it shows I'm one of his sheep. Uh, go back to 1 John 2 real quickly. We'll look at this one. I don't think we'll have time. No, we won't have time to look at the results of assurance. I'll have to let you read those on your own. 1 John 2, 3. And hereby do we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, and him verily is the love of God perfected, whereby we know that we are in him. My willingness to hear his voice and respond to him shows that I'm in him. I'm one of his sheep. I'm his child. It proves that I know him. Obedience is the key there. It is the desire and plan of God that all believers know that they're saved. God has so designed it that we, we do not have to guess or wonder about eternal life. It is truly a no-so salvation. Now quickly, I just want you to see these. I don't have time to teach on them, but I want to, just to read them through you. What are the, uh, read through them with you. What's the results of me having assurance of my salvation? I'll have joy. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. But 1 John 1, 4, these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. We can have joy. Number two, we have confidence toward God. 1 John 3, 19 through 21. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and, and shall assure our hearts before him for our if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, 
If the heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And then last of all, the results of having assurance, we will overcome the world. 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5. Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. God wants us to have assurance. I encourage you to take these home, look those verses up. We'll go ahead and pray, and then we'll distribute these in a moment. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your, your church today. Thank you for these that came to class. I pray you'd help us to understand the importance of having the assurance of our salvation, knowing that we're saved. I pray you would take these truths, burn them into our hearts. I pray you'd help us as we go into the next service. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.